We felt like we had maybe the best McDonald's class ever. We, we, we are in class of 95, we'll argue that with anybody. So there was at one point um, that we said that we might should go do a Fab Five, a new Fab Five at Michigan. What's going on? I'm ESPN Sports Center anchor Jay Harris. Uh, the other gentleman with the headphones on his head, that's Mark Spears, senior NBA writer for ESPN's Anscape and also a basketball Hall of Famer. And today is going to be fun. Mark, you want to introduce our special guest? You know what? I, I was going to pull up his bio. I don't, I don't need to pull up this dude's bio, man. Like, I, <laughs> this is my, this is family. This is my brother right here, man. This is uh, Park Hill's finest. Mr. Park Hill himself, that's Denver's uh, story neighborhood, Chauncey Billups, George Washington High, two-time Mr. Basketball. Tell me if I'm wrong, Chauncey, at Colorado. Yeah, you're wrong. Three times. Three times. Three <laughs> times. All right. My bad. My bad. Uh, hey, we don't even got to do the intro. We don't even do no, it. No, man. man. McDonald's All-American, <laughs> greatest player ever to play at Colorado, third pick in the 1997 NBA draft by the Boston Celtics. Uh, but most notably, a champion, finals MVP, five-time All-Star, 2010 World Cup champ, and now the coach of the Portland Trail Blazers. One of the greatest stories of adversity I've ever seen in the NBA, uh, getting over a hill to become a champion. Uh, a lot of motivation that could come from the one and only man, Mr. Big Shot Chauncey Billups, man. Welcome to the show. My guys, I appreciate that, man. I appreciate it. Mark, Jay. You know, I love both of y'all, man. Uh, I appreciate y'all doing this, and I'm excited about y'all's podcast, man. But, Charles, I know getting in the Hall of Fame for you, man, like, per your career, ain't nothing come easy. Um, take us to April's Fool's Day. You're getting the call. You're, 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 the Blazers got a game against Orlando. You're in Orlando. Take Take us through that that whole scene, because I I'm guessing nap time is probably you know something you do between the game, but I I'll, I'll let you tell the story. Yeah, it is. I mean, it was a uh, you know it was good to just finally have a day, and there was they gave us a day and a time frame that they were going to be calling everybody, and we were going to be playing Orlando that night uh, on the road. And I did, I usually take a nap, you know, I still take my game day naps because I need to be my freshest at seven o'clock. So um, I forfeited my nap this day because the time they were gonna call between 12 and two. I'm like, all right, cool. It's like so somebody I, dropping off appliances, right? Like 12 exactly. to two. Like <laughs> <laughs> so I went, uh, I went and there's a there's a beautiful little lake downtown Orlando where you could walk up and just just start making some laps. So I went on a little walk, had my head uh, headphones on, and uh, it was not too far after twelve fifteen, I got the call. And so, you know, you're thinking about all type of stuff, man. For one, the fact that it's April Fools is is a sick little thing anyway. And uh, but I'm sitting there like, man, I'm getting this call. This is kind of early in that in that time gap. This might be good news, you know. Uh, so I'm like, I'm I'm prepared and I'm 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 ready, man. I've been dying for this call, and uh, obviously, Jerry and the crew they call, and uh, they basically was just like, man, I know it's been a long wait, and I know you've been anticipating this call, but we wanted to give you the good news, and you know you made it. And so I was, uh, I just couldn't stop smiling, man. I was just so happy, um, so proud, so many things you know, going through my head at the time. And I just can't believe that I'm getting this car and making the Hall of Fame. You know, it was crazy. What What were some of the things that were going through your head? Just my journey, you know, my journey, Jay. I mean, I, it, it's like like Mark said, my it was all, it, it was never easy for me, man. It was never easy for me. Um, I always had to go in the back door, you know, um, anywhere, so. You know, after being the third pick in the draft, that was, you know, kind of the only thing that was, that was the easiest thing for me to do was be that pick. After that, it was tough the whole way. And so, um, 
I always say this, like my 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 journey and my route and my road that I took to the Hall of Fame from making the NBA, just from making the NBA to the Hall, I always say that the road that I took, it didn't have very much traffic on it, man. You know, it wasn't a lot of people there. It wasn't a lot of people there. It was It was a windy, tough road, and I'm proud of it, you know. So I'm thinking about all of those things when I'm getting this call, and I'm saying, dang, I still made it, man. You know, I still made it, you know. So that was just a great moment for me. Yeah, you know, um, the one thing that also could have come easy or was expected to come easy was you were like this five-star recruit. You know, Cal wanted you, UNLV wanted you, Kansas wanted you, Georgia Tech wanted you. I think your road to Colorado was probably one of the craziest recruiting roads ever. Can you kind of go back and like talk about all these different places you could have went to and what went wrong? Yeah, you know, it was crazy. You know, that process goes, you you narrow your list down to five. And my five were uh, it was Michigan, Kansas, Georgia Tech, Cal, and Arizona. And Colorado wasn't even in my top five, even though it's right here, it's home. And the coach that was recruiting me, which his name is Ricardo Patton, um, I loved him, man. I loved him, but I wasn't going to waste a trip there because I, I was going there all the time. One of my high school teammates was there, so I was familiar. So I went on a couple visits, and, um, you know, every visit that I went on, I would come home. And I just could tell, like, my mom was happy and she was, like, excited to hear what happened and how it was. But I could tell that she was she she was sad, you know, like, dang, my baby's about to leave for real. And so, you know, I had lost my grandmother at the start of my uh, senior year. And then the start of my, I mean, the end of the year, my grandfather passed. So I just, I just made up my mind one day, bro. I was like, you know what? It's not time for me to leave. You know, my people need me. So I just made up my mind. I had a press conference at the rec center that I grew up in. And um, I just, I turned over, had that Colorado hat, and everybody was like, what? Colorado? Even my people from here was like, man, what in the world? Why would he turn down all them schools? So, you know, I just... I felt in my heart and in my spirit that was a, that was a place and that was where I needed to be at. And if I was going to make it, you know, fate, you can't control fate. You know, I was going to work my behind off of regardless. And now was Georgia Tech part of that fate? Because you went and visited. I, like, tell me, is this story true about how you go and visit, you're flying back and Marbury commits while you're in the air? That is true. That is true. So they have one. So Travis Best was leaving to go pro. They have one scholarship and they were recruiting Steph, who was the number one point guard in the country at the time. And then I was the number two. And so Steph went on his visit um, the week before me. And they told us all along, like, whichever guy comes first, we appreciate everything else. But that's where we're going. So Steph went on his visit. He didn't commit. I was due to go next week. I went, had an awesome visit. Um, and then you, you ate chicken wings on the visit? You, you, you had some lemon pepper? You had lemon peppers on the visit? We had a little lemon pepper on the visit. <laughs> we had a little, we had a little, little with a lemon pepper on the visit. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was in the air and I think Steph got a little nervous. Um, and Steph and I were really close at the time um, too. So we were talking through the whole process. And man, before I landed and got home, he had committed and was like, I'm going to Georgia Tech, you know. Uh, so you were, so, were you upset? No, no, I wasn't upset. I mean, I had so many other good options uh, out there. I wasn't upset, but I did like Georgia Tech. I did really enjoy, um, I'm from Denver, you know what I'm saying? So me going to Atlanta and seeing all these people that look like me, it was just a beautiful, beautiful thing and a rich tradition hoop wise with Bobby Crimmins at Georgia. I mean, it was beautiful. They they raised point guards. I mean, they it was it was a beautiful thing. So of course I was I was intrigued by it, but no, I wasn't upset, no. Where else could you have gone? Or were you thinking about after Georgia Tech, after Stefan said, you know, I'm thinking I'm I'm going to Georgia Tech. Yeah, Kansas. Kansas uh was one. Arizona was one. 
Michigan um, was another one that, you know, we all just love the Fab Five, you know, and we felt like we had maybe the best McDonald's class ever. We, we, we are in class of 95, we'll argue that with anybody. So there was at one point um, that we said that we might should go do a, a, a Fab Five, a new Fab Five at Michigan. And uh, it was it was crazy. KG, Marbury, Paul Pierce, myself, and Tractor Trailer was already going. He's from Detroit. Robert Tractor Trailer, y'all remember him? Man, so nobody really committed early because of that. And most people don't know the story. And KG didn't pass the test, so he would have to you know go prop. So he ended up going pro. And so everybody just kind of dispersed in. But yeah, man, it was we had a lot, we had a lot of little things on the on the wire, man. If KG passes the ACT or the SAT, how different is his journey and perhaps y'all college journey? Like, were you guys gonna go there? Yeah, I mean, we we were we were we were close, we were very, very close to it. We were just waiting on that last chip to fall. And but we were all like, oh man, this, you know, but we couldn't, you know, you you couldn't make no commitment, obviously, at that time. But just think about that, you know, what 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 that would have looked like. You know? crazy. That's a cold tea. That, that might have been, been better than the Fab. That would have been better than the Fab Five. Ridiculous. I agree. I agree. Yeah, respectfully. Mm -hmm. That, that would have been better. So you go to Boston, man, and you're going to the Celtics. You got all the banners. You're going to a rich basketball tradition. You're the third overall pick. Yeah, like. When did you realize, okay, this, there's no patience here. Like, when did you start feeling like the Boston situation wasn't going to be a good one for, from you? And how crazy was a day when you were, it's one thing to be in trade rumors, and I don't know if you heard that, but to be, I I don't know that there's any ever been a top five pick traded during a rookie season. It was, it was so crazy, man. It really was like, um, I was so excited to be there. You know, we, it was a young team. Antoine Walker was the star of the team. He was finishing, he had finished his rookie year. He was balling. Myself and Ron Mercer just got drafted number three and number six. And then Rick Patino was coming in at the same time. And so when I watched Kentucky play, I'm like, man, this is probably going to be perfect. Like he won get up and down, play defense, and then rip and run and shoot a lot of threes and play fast. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be so much fun. And so um, I started off the season. I didn't start the first two games. I didn't start. He didn't have me in the starting lineup. I didn't – wasn't tripping on that. I was playing. I played a lot. And then the third, by the third game, he put me in the starting lineup. And it's so crazy because I wasn't playing poorly. You know, the fans loved me. I just felt like – Boston, the Celtics, I mean, that history is crazy. Like, they wasn't trying to hear no rebuild, you know. Um, but I was playing well. The fans loved me. I loved it. It was, it seemed to be cool on the inside. But then, you you know, you hear all the, all the chatter, you know. Um, but that trade chatter started draft night. Um, that was the year that Chicago was thinking about moving Scotty. And we had, obviously, Boston had three and six. And so by a, a, there was a lot of speculation on draft night that myself and Ron were going to be going to Chicago. So it, ha it started day one. And then it ended, obviously, it was at the trade deadline. I think I played 50 games. And I can remember meeting with Coach, um, and he came to my room. He was honest with me. We was on a road, long road trip. 13 day road trip out West was in Sacramento. And uh, he just said, you know, I think you're going to be a good player, but um, I have a chance to get a guy that I've been a big fan of forever. He's one of the greatest to ever come out of New York city. Um, I need to speed this process up here and I think he can get me there, but, and he loved Kenny Anderson. And so everybody loved Kenny Anderson, you know, at that time. So, he was just like, I got an opportunity to get him. So, you know, we're going to make the trade. I want to wish you luck, whatever, whatever, whatever. And I was like embarrassed. 
you know, just from being traded so early, but also was kind of happy um, to get away from Rick. You know, I, I didn't enjoy playing for him. Um, so it was, it was, it was actually a pretty cool thing, but it's just like, man, I'm the third pick in the draft. I'm, I've, I lasted 50 games in this town, you know, and on this team. So that was, that sucked. That part of it sucked, but you know, it just there, there began the journey, man. So, all right. So we're out of Boston. Then where do we go? Toronto. I went to Toronto and that was cool, man. I was playing for Butch Carter. Um, <laughs> he was a good coach. Yeah, Butch was cool as heck, man. He was like, but man, you look at the young guys we had. Myself and T Mac were rookies. Um, Marcus Camby was the rookie of the year before. He was like a a, a a growing stud in the league, and Doug Christie was probably our best player. Like we we had some talent. We had some talent, and then the season was over, and I go home to Denver for the summer, we have a lockout. So our season doesn't start on time. You know, um, the day the lockout was over, um, the day the lockout was over, I uh, I was traded from Toronto to Denver. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Denver, I think, was maybe was the worst team in the league the year before, or had the worst record, something like that, the year before. And so I was traded back home. Nick Van Exel was also traded here to Denver. You know, so that was, again, another crazy part of my journey. I never played shooting guard in my life. Um, but obviously coming here to Denver um, at that young age, I'm 22, something like that, 21, 22. And Nick is coming here. Nick's obviously kind of like an all-star. He's an all-star, so I'm not going gonna, gonna to be playing beside Nick, you know, with him. But I looked at it like, man, you know, I, there's somebody that I can learn a lot from. You know, even though this is not my position, now I just got to kind of find a way, you know, in the league. So, yeah, I, I was here in Denver for, I don't know, it ended up, it was a lockout year. So it ended up being, I don't know, 50 some games. I don't know. And then I get, I get hurt that open that, uh, start that next season. I get hurt, dislocate my shoulder. I'm out for the season. And during that time, I get traded to Orlando. Just wait, part, wait, part wait, wait, wait. So you're right, you're home. Yeah. You're back in Denver. You're thinking, like, I'm gonna learn this new position, and things still didn't live. Hey, you didn't live happily ever after. <laughs> no, 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 not not at all. Not at all. Not at all. But you know, it was it was all good. It was all good. I, I wasn't ready to be home, to be honest with you, anyway. I, mean, I remember I was there with you. I think it was a lot for you. That was exactly where I met Mark at, Spears at. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that, by the way. He broke into the league. <laughs> 1999, 2000 season, yeah. baby. Yeah. You were, yeah. I, I didn't cover you that long there, but oh, you, you were didn't. there at the beginning. Oh, you didn't. But I still remember uh, that trade. You and, and, and the crazy thing was, Sean, you were like a throw in. Oh, yeah. It was, it was, play. was it Ron Mercer in that trade? Was out. It was Ron Mercer. Really, it was Ronnie Ron Mercer, Taylor, Tariq Abdul Wahed. And oh. yeah, and then, the and then Chris Gatlin came over. And then the throw-ins were myself, Johnny Taylor, um, Gat came. Like we were all just the side dishes, you know. But the big, yeah, yeah, it was so I was traded there. But I, I so I'm gonna interrupt you now. But this is this is this we we Chauncey and I probably had this conversation like 20 times. But we were in New Orleans, right? He's a free agent in 2000. Didn't play for the Magic. Never put on a Magic jersey. Doc didn't want to bring him back. And I remember, you'll laugh at this, Jay. We go to my cousin's house. I don't know if you remember this, Chauncey. And my cousin had a barbecue. And we, yeah, my, uh, my we, there was a brother I played with at uh, Foothill College, Matisse Moore. He's with us. So that's how me and Chauncey had connected through him. So we're at Essence Music Festival. Chauncey comes by my cousin's house for a barbecue. My cousin Alvin Ray, this dude gonna tell us while Chauncey's standing there, man, if y'all work hard, y'all could have a house like this one day. <laughs> like he said, <laughs> he said that to, and we kind of looked at like, man, do you know, he didn't even know who Chauncey, he didn't recognize Chauncey. Yeah, yeah. Then we go have some lunch and T. Lou was with us and T. Lou just won a championship, right? 
Lil Wayne drives by on um on Canal Street. It's me, Chauncey, T. Lou, and Matisse Moore. Not Martise Moore, Matisse Moore. And Lil Wayne's like, what's, what's up, champ? What's up, champ? Yelling at T. Lou. And don't say nothing to Chauncey. I like, you know, why they disrespected this man today, right? But the one thing I remember, 2000, like, Chauncey was busting his tail, but he kept getting hurt. And he was in a really tough position as a free agent. Like, I, Chauncey, I'll let you take it from there. Like, were you was there some fear at that time about what your future was going to be or not be in the NBA and, and what ultimately ended up happening? Well, what happens is this. You, you come in as a third pick and your, your aspirations and you think it's pretty close for you to, like, Man, if I ball out like I'm I'm gonna be an all-star, you know, I'm um my next level. And then you fall all the way off like I did. And now you saying, man, I gotta prove that I belong in this league. Like I gotta prove that I belong here now. And that's kind of where I was at. Like, here, here's here's I need another chance to prove that I actually belong in this league. And then once I do that, I'm gonna get back to my regular scheduled program. I'm gonna show them. You know, and so that's where I was at after that year in or, or after that little time in Orlando when I was a free agent and I ended up signing in Minnesota, which is where it was the best. It was the best gift I ever got, man. You know, be able to go to Minnesota. I was with one of my closest dudes in KG. Um, I loved Flip Saunders, man. God bless the dead, man. I, I asked my man. I, I loved Flip the way that he coached was tailor-made for my game. And mind you, I still wasn't ready to go like that, but I was, this was a great situation for me. But then I met Terrell Brandon and I met Sam Mitchell. And those, those two dudes changed my life, man. They changed my life. And simply put like, Terrell taught me how to be a point guard. Everything about it. Everything about it, how to study, how to study my opponents, how to study my teammates, how to what to do myself, when to shoot, when to facilitate, everything. And Sam taught me how to be a pro. And so my life changed forever, those two dudes. I, I, I get them so much credit all the time. So being able to spend two years there, um, it was everything. And 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 with my time there, I just never, obviously never looked back. I went to Detroit from there and it was over. Yeah, do you remember your options and why for in 2000, your free agency options and why you chose Minnesota? Were there any other really good options? I really don't remember my options at that time. Um, I remember uh, when I was about to leave Minnesota, it was either Miami or Detroit. Um well, Minnesota, Miami, or Detroit. And I was going to get the same amount of money in all every every place. It was the mid-level exception. So um, they all were offering me that. So I can remember that. But I don't remember, I don't remember my options at that point. Why did you sign with Detroit? In all honesty, I didn't want to leave Minnesota because I had finally turned that corner, I felt like. But, and I and I give Kevin McHale so much credit to this day. He was the GM at the time. And Terrell Brandon got hurt my second year, which allowed me to get the reins. And he was due to come back that summer. And he said, Chance, I want you back. We'll pay you whatever we, we'll do what we got to do. But just know if Terrell's healthy, we got to start Terrell, you know. And I just respected him so much for just being honest with me, you know. Um, but at the same time, it was finally time. You know, I finally was ready. And so it was Detroit and it was Miami. And I felt like Detroit was just further along. I felt like they just needed a point guard. Um, they had just went to the second round of the playoffs. Ben Wallace was, uh, he had just won defensive player of the year. Corliss won six men of the year. They, Rick Carlisle was the coach. Like I just felt like everybody was on their way up there. Um, so it was, it has strictly all to do with basketball, you know, um, and my career and my life at the time. I had two kids already, two daughters already. I was married already. Um, so, man, it, it was, it was, 
The beach, though, the beach, Charles, yeah. like you had to, you could have been at the beach. You went to the yeah, snow. I I could have been, but I wasn't worried about no damn beach. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, <laughs> yeah. trying to get my career going so I could buy a beach house one day. Yeah, yeah. When did you know that? I mean, you had this group in Detroit with obviously Ben, undrafted, and then Rip, and and then Tay, like Rashid. Like you had all these guys that were talented, but you know, for some something happened in their career where they didn't go quite right, right? Um, kind of a seemed as a misfit of some sort or something was, you know, but when did you know, okay, we, we got a super group without having so-called superstars? Yeah. Yeah. I thought like my first year there, um, we were really good. We were a really good team. Um, we had some veterans and then we had guys like myself, um, and Ben who had kind of been around a little, but just, hadn't really found the right footing. Obviously Ben had done that in Detroit a year or so before me. And then Rip Hamilton, uh, we traded for him. So when I signed with Detroit, Jerry Stackhouse was starting two guard. And then, I don't know, three, four weeks, two, three weeks later, they traded Stack for Rip Hamilton. We traded, well, I mean, excuse me, we uh, we drafted Tayshaun Prince that same year. So, um, I love the group of guys that we had, you know, and I loved playing for Rick Carlisle. He was one of the best young coaches in the game at the time. So I felt like we had some good chemistry, some good synergy. We was a couple few pieces away, but our main pieces, I felt like could grow for a long time. So I felt like we, we had something special there. Well, you did. Um, fast forwarding to the battle in the finals against the Lakers. Um, you felt like y'all had something special there in Detroit, but no one thought you had a chance against the Lakers. Uh, probably except for you guys. Mm -hmm. Um, so what was y'all's mindset going into that series? Yeah, you know, styles make fights. And um I felt really good about the series, you know. In, in fact, it's a true story. I, I before the series started, I told my wife we was gonna beat them. My wife was like, man, what? They got Kobe. They got shit. She going down the list, right? <laughs> I said, all right, all right. So I really did feel good about the series. And I wasn't, I'm not a like arrogant, cocky dude. Like I, I when I say something, I'm I've like I, I put time in on that. But I just knew that I felt like we could guard them. Um, they had the better players obviously, but they didn't have a better team. Mm. And they had brought GP that year and Carl Malone and Horace Grant. They had everybody. Um, but I just feel like we could guard them. Um, they couldn't score enough to beat us. And our two best offensive players, they had no answer for our actions. And one was rip and pin downs. If I call whatever pin down play and I just keep running them off and run off Shaq side, he's not going to be able to get there, you know, um, because he wants to stay in that paint. And then pick and rolls, bringing the big fell out of the paint and being able to open up the floor. So I felt like we could get a good shot any possession we wanted to. And I don't think that they could because of our defense. So I just felt good about the series. And uh, you're right, nobody else really did. but. You see what happened. Well, what did it mean to you? Because at that time, you hadn't even been an all-star yet. I'm, I'm guessing you're the only person that won finals MVP that had not been an all-star ever. I think there was somebody, it was one more person, because I remember they saying something about that. Uh, I don't know who it was. I don't know if it was Joe Dumars or. I, I rem You probably don't remember. You told me this. You're like, man, when you win that trophy that summer, when you're the MVP of the finals, you're the, you're the MVP of the league for the whole summer. Best player in the world. You are the best. You win the finals MVP. You're the best player in the entire world. Until next time. There's, I, there's, nobody can nobody can argue me that. But but here's my thing. I didn't care about the MVP though. I really didn't. I had I didn't I didn't care at all. What I was dying to prove was that I can lead a team to a championship and what I have been through as a point guard, and I can like make this thing flow flawlessly, still get mines, 
that's all. That's what I cared about. The MVP just kind of happened. You know, I didn't, I didn't care about that. I was, what I cared about was winning a championship, bro. So, you know, I, that, that was just kind of icing on the, on the cake for me. Yeah. And I, AJ, hey, I'll tell you this. I don't know if you ever got there, but when you went to Auburn Hills, bro, for a game, like incredible. It's like Oracle and Auburn Hills. In my opinion, like they had, it was it was like you were going to Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, like like they were when they would be like Shanti, bum, 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 bum. like they'd be going crazy. Then all of a sudden, there's fireworks and Larry Brown's like ducking every time. He never could figure out where the fireworks were coming. But when they did Ben's introduction, don't don't like. I don't know. I don't know that anybody, the KG Celtics introduction was dope with him screaming and everything. But I don't, I don't know if anybody had a more intimidating introduction than y'all did. No, Benz was Benz was awesome, man. Benz was Benz was the best. One thing I always thought about when I was when I was those young years, when we would go play the Bulls, I can remember pulling up about to play them, knowing like, man, we don't have a chance in this game. <laughs> And then you you see there like jumbotron and you know, <laughs> all of that, right? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Down to MJ and all that. I just remembered. And those now, times. Yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> I just remembered those times, and I was like, "Damn, all these people looking at us like that." You know what I'm saying? They yeah. they seeing <laughs> us like that because you ain't getting no wins in this building. No. So, and yeah, it's gonna be rough. It's like it's gonna be tough. So I just always remember, like, damn, I wonder do they feel how I felt when I was a youngin, you know? So yeah, Ben's drum was crazy though. Shout out to Mason, right? Shout out to oh, Mason. The he did best. The intro, intro. Man, Mason, the best. That was a very special building. I did good. I did do one game there, and because uh, I took my son, and some guy chased me down uh, in the outer corridor because he thought I was Kevin DeGandhi. Oh wow! <laughs> okay, <laughs> chased wow. me down and said, "Kevin the Gandhi." It's like, no, it's like, uh, and my buddy was like, "You don't even know who he is." He's like, "I love your work." He said, "You don't know who I am. How do you love my work?" Hey, but Chauncey, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you this, man. What was more painful, losing to the Spurs in seven, or losing to LeBron James? No, no, that's not even close. I wasn't even going to let you say the next one. Losing in game seven to whoever. It just happened to be the Spurs. Yeah. And that's the worst feeling ever. You never get over that, bro. You never, ever get over that. Uh, do you still think about that game from time to time? All the time, bro. All the time, bro. All the time. I, you never get over that, man. Losing in game seven. Um, I mean, obviously, it was on the road. It was a great two of the best two teams in it. But man, that was a hell of a series. Pop and I talk about this. Coach Pop and I talk about this sometimes. That series is what changed basketball. And follow me. It was an incredible series. The top two defensive teams in the league. Seven game series, but the scores was like 84 to 81. 88 to 83. I mean, it was the most physical slow down, walk it up basketball and it was some of the worst ratings in NBA finals history. Yes. Albeit a great series, the great worst series in the history. I think the only one that beat it was maybe uh I don't know Spur, if was, uh Spurs Cavs, cast. Spurs. I think that's the only one that beat it. So however that series changed the game where they said, oh, no, no, we got to we got to start allowing some freedom of movement where guys score a lot. I mean, this is this is terrible. That series changed the game, man. Hmm. It did. Mm -hmm. Hardcore basketball fans could appreciate it. But like, like yeah. we need some scoring because exactly. we, want people to, we need some eyeballs <laughs> on this, this this product. Yeah, that's what happened. That's what happened. In the beginning, Mark rattled off uh, three nicknames. He didn't say smooth, though. Again, Mr. Big Shot, smooth and the king of Park Hill. Which one is your favorite? Um, <laughs> oh man, I would. There's only really two that you know. Uh, smooth is the one that nobody 
until I got to high school and started being in the newspaper, mm -hmm. nobody really knew my actual name unless we was in school together, class or something. They just knew me as smooth. So when somebody calls me that, like, I'm like, they really know me. Like, they really know, me, you know. Um, and then Mr. Big Shot, I think, is one of the best names ever because you got to earn that name, you know. Um, and so, ah, man, that's a close one. I would, I would maybe say Big Shot, maybe, maybe Big Shot. Who, who gave you smooth? Who gave me smooth? So there's a guy, yeah, man, you y'all might know him. I don't know, but back um played for the University of Indiana. His name is Bobby Wilkerson. Y'all remember that Ooh, name? I remember that name, yeah, yeah. So Bobby used to play, he had played for the Nuggets for a little bit, and he started coaching in my neighborhood. So what he would do, every he coached at my rec center, and one of my first couple of years of playing, one of the cool things about Bob was Everybody that made the team, he gave them a nickname. And that was the nickname he gave me, but he gave everybody one. But for some reason, mine's just stuck. You know, I'm like in fifth grade, you know, um, and mine's just stuck. And then everybody just, everybody called me that. But that's how I got that that nickname, though. Chunks, you have a, a smooth, you got a jersey retired in Detroit. Everything beautiful, the most beautiful things in your career happened in Detroit. What is it like now when you go back there to coach and, and, and just what is, what does the Pistons franchise mean to you? Man, it's, it's the, it's the most beautiful thing. Um, when I go back there, like no matter where I'm at in the city, I just feel so at home, man. I just feel so at home and they treat me like I'm born and raised and I like still live there, you know? Um, we have this incredible mutual love for each other, you know, me and, and just all of the people in Detroit, not just the organization, which obviously, you know, my affinity for, for the organization, but it just means so much to me. You know, I spent to me the best, the best years of my life was spent there in Detroit. You know, my kids were young, we went to great schools there. My youngest daughter was born there. My, the, my best years of my career was there. Um, it was just incredible, man. It was just incredible. So I, I, everything about Detroit, I just love it. You know, I don't care where I am across over, anywhere in the world. And somebody tell me they're from Detroit. I stop and talk to them. We chop it up. You know, we, it's, it's almost like I know them, but I don't, you know, and they probably feel the same way about me. So it's just this incredible, um, two-way relationship. That's, that's beautiful, man. I want to talk about uh, currently um, you're going to be, you know, get the big, the hall of fame celebration. And, and, and but then, you know, it's down to business. Uh, you have a coaching job to do in uh, year three in Portland. Um, what are your thoughts on how you you're going to turn this, this, the team around the franchise around? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm really excited about, um, we got some good young players, Jay. You know, we really do. They just, we just young, man. I think I seen something yesterday where we're the second youngest team in the league this year. But, um, you know, I have a tough job to develop, you know, Scoot Henderson, who had a tough year last year, you know, young point guard I'm trying to, you know, develop. And then Shaden Sharp, who was injured last year, really good, young, talented dude as well. Anthony Simons, who... I think it's really, really close to 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 being like all star potential, all star level, and then we drafted Donovan Kling, and so we got a lot of young players um, that I think are going to be good in this league. And me, you know, I, I'm all about winning. You know, that's I'm I'm actually going into the Hall of Fame because I was a winner. You know, um, um, so the losing that comes with rebuilding is difficult. You know, it's difficult, but it's something that I'll never get used to, you know, because I'm never going to get used to losing. But it just kind of is what it is. It's a part of the process. you got to understand and respect the process. And I'm happy to be doing it. I really am. I love coaching, man. I love coaching. The folks in uh, folks in Bristol, Connecticut are really excited about Donovan, so they got all the eyes on you. Oh, hoping, they are. <laughs> hoping some good things happen. Oh, they are. <laughs> <laughs> Johns, you uh, I, I'm not asking you this question directly, 
because I know. But I uh, would I be correct in saying that when fans come up to you, do you get asked about Melo? What if with Melo more than anything else? And, it, and it, do you get tired of that question? No, I don't get tired of it. I don't get tired of it. That's my dude. So, but I do get asked that a lot. You know, um, there's Melo got some really, really diehard fans, man. Uh, rightfully so. You know, he's one of the greatest. So I do get asked that a lot. Like, man, what if he was in Detroit and how many chips would y'all have won? Or what if he never left Denver? Cause y'all have won a championship, you know? So yeah, I get, I get asked um, a lot of times about Melo. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, because I feel like if if let, let me put you back, because you're coaching a lot of young guys. Yeah. If you were coaching that Pistons team, right? Yeah. Is there anything you would have done differently with Darko Milicic that you think might have made him more successful? Because he did have the height, he did have the athleticism, he did have the skill set, but he walked into this veteran group. Like, do you think the Pistons could have done something differently that could have maybe made him more successful? Oh, uh, first of all, Darko was, he was a good player, man. He, he, he had a, he had good potential. Um, we were just trying, we was, we were so ready to like try to go win the championship. You know, we were, we had championship aspirations. Most of the time, young, young guys can't, you got no room. You're not, you don't have time to develop them because you lose three or four games because this guy made these mistakes and now you're the three seed and not the one seed. You you don't have home court advantage against a tough team. So it was just a tough situation. Um, I don't know how they could have handled him any better, to be honest with you, other than just say, hey, we got to take our medicine, play him. Just play him. Let, just get a, give him 20 minutes a night and play him to see if he develops and how quickly he does. But, man, we just had so many goons over there ready to go. You know, and we was trying to get it, man. Talking about the Hall of Fame, because you have uh, some, you know, you have some work to do. You got a nice speech to prepare and you got to figure out who's going to present you. What what can you tell us about both of those things? Well, um, my speech is going good. I'm not done with it yet, but it's going good. Um, my presenters are going to be Larry Brown, Ben Wallace, and my homegirl, Tina Thompson. Oh, oh cool. nice. Yeah, yeah. Can you can you talk about why each person? Well, obviously, Larry, you know, um, if it's not for Larry and Ben Wallace, then I don't think me or Ben is not in the Hall of Fame, you know, if we don't have that run in Detroit. Um, Larry, he nobody made me better. You know, no other coach made me better than Larry. Um, no other coach drove me crazy like Larry too. <laughs> he he was relentless, man. He was relentless and he got the best out of me. And I, I tell people all the time, he he made me understand and learn how to become, go from being a scoring point guard to a point guard that could score and knowing the difference of the two. And I think that that alone uh, really propelled me. So I just love that dude. I'll jump off a bridge for him. I'll do anything for him. Ben, um, you know, we we brothers, man. You know, we 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 really did that together in Detroit. And I think his journey is one of the one of the most unique you will ever, ever find. I think he's the first undrafted player to make the Hall of Fame or something like that. I mean, his story is, is crazy. So we we locked in at the hip, you know. Um, and then Tina. Tina and I have been very, very dear friends for 20 plus years, man, 20 plus years. And I just, I got so much respect for the women's game and for the WNBA and her being a hall of famer. Uh, I just thought, man, this would just be a beautiful time to just show her some love. Um, and just, you know, people know about our relationship anyway. No, Chauncey, uh, from my time in Denver, they had a pro team there for a minute. And I know the WNBA is trying to get another team. Portland got one. I'm sure you're excited about that. But why isn't Denver talking? Like, Denver actually creates a lot of great women basketball players. But I have not heard Denver's name as a 
a WNBA candidate. Like, I, I don't know. I think Denver would be a great city for the WNBA. I do, too. I do, too. I think they've been in the mix a couple times. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for it in Portland. I really am. I've, I've been a huge, huge fan of that WNBA, and it just keeps getting better and better. But, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think Denver would be a great market, man. I'm, I'm, I'm confused on why they haven't done it yet. Yeah, Chance, I wanted to uh, make a couple more questions, but what about it? Uh, you, you've had some great coaches. You have some coaches that disappoint you. What do, have you taken from your coaches? And what have you said? Nah, I ain't going to do what this coach does to coach your team now. Well, I think the biggest thing, the the, the absolute biggest thing, when I said that I was going to coach, um, you start to just think about, okay, what coaches got the best out of you, you know? Um, and what coaches did you, you know, I was like, oh, I'm cool. The very, the biggest thing that I promised myself is that I will always be honest with our, with my guys, no matter if they like it or not, if it's about playing time or about this or that, like I was never going to lie to my dudes because I hate it when coaches lied to me. And I hate it when coaches said, oh yeah, you're going to, play this much or you're going to run this many plays for you. Or I'm going to, but it don't work out that way. Cause truth of the matter is they could say all of that, but what if I come in and I'm not very good? They're not going to do that, you know? Um, so why lie? You know? So that's, to me, that's the biggest thing. I challenge my dudes. Um, I'm honest with them the entire time, but I, I, I love to teach, you know, my, the best teachers. That's are, the Larry Brown in you, huh? That's the Larry Brown and me. Um, he's just a teacher, man. He's just a teacher. And I just felt like that's what I do too, you know? So that's the reason why I got into it. Into is I feel like, I really feel like I'm giving back to this next generation from what people taught me. We began this conversation with you talking about the road that you have traveled, the highway that you've been on. And, and, and many times it's just you on that road. Um, it's gotten you to the Hall of Fame. What about your journey would you have changed? Mm, that's a great question. Um, probably not very much. Probably not very much. Um, it was all very tough, Jay. You know, it was all very tough and it was tough to go through it. It was lonely going through it sometimes. But what I learned about me and the person that I am now um, and the, the million ways that I can lead people and connect with people and meet people halfway because I actually been through it, it's, it's priceless. You know, it really is priceless. Like I'm looking at my team now that I coach like there's nothing that any of those guys could go through that I haven't actually been through. Not that I heard about that I haven't been through. And so I think it, it, it keeps me so, you know, so connected with these dudes. So there's probably not much that I would change through, throughout my journey, especially knowing that it led me where I wanted to be at inevitably anyway. Chance, we're going let you go but i wanted to ask you two quick things before we let you out um how did that weekend you're in the middle of the preseason like yeah are, are you gonna miss any games like what is that whole weekend gonna be like for you because that's i assume you'll get there friday i don't know if you get or maybe you get there saturday morning i don't know like what's your schedule uh with the blazers versus hall of fame but also i want you to end on this um, what can people learn from your story? But the the the, the business part first. Yeah, well, my schedule is going to be crazy. I mean, we play the Clippers in Seattle on the eleventh, so that's the Friday night. So I'll coach that game, leave after that game, and it really kind of be like a red eye, you know. And then take that, and then I'll get there obviously in the morning of the twelfth do all of the things on the 12th. Our team plays at SAC on the 13th, the same night as the induction. So obviously I'll miss that game. Um, and then I'll just get back, you know, to Portland on the 14th. So the schedule is crazy. It'll be, it'll be full, full speed ahead the whole time. 
I probably got about 40, 50 people coming out there. So it's be a lot of people to entertain. Um, and secondly, so the question that you ask, um, what can people take away from my story? The biggest thing I would say um, is that I just, I, I never gave in, man. I never gave in. I never believed what people said about me, you know, that I was a bust or I wasn't going to make it. I, I never believed it. You know, I just knew I needed a little more time. You know, I was, I, I always had this incredible work ethic. Um, always had this incredible love for the game. Always been a real competitor. And so I knew that those things, I just needed more time. My game just wasn't ready, you know? Um, so I never believed any of those things, the naysayers. I just didn't. I just, I stayed confident. I stuck to what I believed in and I just kept chipping. I just kept chipping away. And I think if that's one thing that people could take away from me is, is I never gave in. I never gave in to what people said and thought. I, I stuck to what I believe and I made it out that way. Well, smooth, yes, man. Did. All the way to the hall. Love it. Respect. Yes, sir. Respect, I appreciate y'all, man.